In the past year, we have been hiking quite a lot all over Norway and therefore also had to rather painfully realize how much the terrain is actually changing, even on short distances. In that regard, I thought it would be a good idea to go through a bit of a packing list and show you a few things that made our life up here much easier and will hopefully do the same for you on either your first or your next hike in Norway. Priority number one is having dry feet. And normal boots are not suitable for many places up here. So we got ourselves a used pair of mountain slash hiking boots. And they are doing the job no matter which terrain we're in. If you tie them up really tight, you can even cross rivers without getting them completely soaked. The only thing that you have to make sure of is to fatten them on a regular basis on all parts of the leather as well as the shoelaces, otherwise they may not last as long with extensive usage, especially as I'm using them pretty much on a daily basis. Alternatively, you can bring a pair of rubber boots and then switch back and forth based on the terrain that you're walking in. Just be aware of the fact that, especially in summer, walking long distances in rubber boots can get pretty uncomfortable. If you have ever walked a few kilometers in 25 degrees with rubber boots and shorts, maybe even wool socks, then you know it can be a bit of a torture. Overall, the mountain boots will definitely be the better choice, but you can get along without them using rubber boots, and it will most likely be a bit cheaper that way. Depending on which season you're hiking in, you will definitely need something with spikes in late fall or the beginning of winter. Otherwise, you're most likely not even making it up the street to the beginning of the hike. As soon as the first snow melts and freezes over again, the mountains up here get really slippery and I can tell you, it gets even worse if there's a dog pulling on the leash. If an extra pair of shoes for one or two seasons seems a bit too much or out of the budget, then there are a few add-on spike options on Amazon but I personally do not have any experiences with it, so you have to give it a try yourself. In terms of clothing, I would prefer it a bit more minimal, but in a way it turned out that it pays off to be prepared for every situation. I'm normally carrying two spare pairs of socks, one thin one and one wool, as well as three spare t-shirts and one spare wool shirt. Even though the shoes might be completely water resistant, there will be this point in time where your socks are getting pretty sweaty and it's nice to switch to something drier a bit more frequent. And the same goes for the t-shirts. It's a good thing to start your hikes with as little clothes as possible and then only add a layer or two if it's getting way too cold. Otherwise the layer that you're wearing closest to your body will get quite sweaty and it is nice to avoid carrying too much wet clothes. Whenever you have a break then try to dry as many shirts as possible and otherwise just attach them to your backpack while you're walking. One more thing, if you were growing up like I did, never needing a wool shirt in your life, then you may not think that it's really necessary to have one, but after being here for a while I can tell you that you will probably appreciate that item the most out of your whole wardrobe and you should always have a spell with you. Or two. I'm also carrying a thick wool sweater for the breaks at the peak and my favorite item, the I don't care hoodie. The I don't care hoodie is pretty much just a regular hoodie that you have absolutely no emotional connection to. So it doesn't matter to you if it is torn apart by branches or if it gets burning holes at the fire. And I personally think this might be the most important item on the whole list. So if you don't have one, then I would recommend you finding one in your wardrobe or going to the next flea market to get one second hand. This thing will make every hike easier. For the very cold days, we are also carrying our old and borrowed Halley Hansen winter sports jackets. They are pretty space efficient and to be honest, I have never been wearing a warmer jacket in all of my life. These ones are from the Olympic Games 1994, so I'm quite sure that they are not available anymore, but I also guess there are enough newer models to choose from.
In terms of water, we're normally just carrying our two Nalgene bottles with a total content of 3 liters. In most of the hikes up here, you will come by clear, fast-moving water to refill your bottle. Just be sure that there is not too much cattle or, in general, animal feces around the water source and you should be good to go. But if you would really like to be on the safe side, there are quite a few live straw bottle options online and they will create drinking water from pretty much any source. We are also bringing along camping gas and a self-igniting burner. This is especially helpful as we are notoriously bad in forgetting matches and lighters, so the self-igniting function has saved our meals quite a few times. A hike in Norway wouldn't be the same without a coffee or tea at the peak. And it isn't allowed to make fires all year round, so the gas burner is pretty much your only option. I normally have a few tea bags with me, but you can also make use of the nature around you. Norway is full of spruce and pine trees, and if you get a hold of a few fresh needles, you can make quite a good tea out of it. For the coffee last year, we had a jet boiler with French press function, but if you're just up for a cup or two, then I think the Bialetti Mocha Maker is doing a great job. It's a little heavy, but quite cheap and pretty much indestructible, so I enjoy carrying that just on the bottom of my backpack. On our last road trip, we also got ourselves a traditional Sami coffee bag, which is made out of reindeer skin. It should be pretty much a once in a lifetime purchase, and for us, it was definitely worth it. It's nothing that you buy outside of Norway, but you could take this as one of your souvenirs from here. As a cup, we're using a lightweight aluminium version that we found here at the cabin. There's nothing special about it, but I guess metal is the right material to survive your backpack. The only thing with these cups is that you have to drink your coffee or tea a little bit faster as everything in it gets cold quite quick, especially on windy mountaintops. Now we are already coming to one of my favorite items on the list, which is a foldable fishing rod that you can use in sweet and salt water. While hiking in Norway, it is pretty hard not to come by a lake, river or the sea where you can catch quite decent fish. In most of the places, you are allowed to fish if you have paid the annual fishing fee, which is around $30. If you're just planning to fish on seawater, you don't even have to pay it. For the fishing rod, I'm also carrying a tiny box with a few lures for salt and sweet water, as well as a good amount of spare quick changes. Obviously, it's also quite helpful to carry a knife or multi-tool to be able to prepare the fish got some tinder or just open a can. I personally really enjoy this Leatherman side clip that I have since I was 10, mainly because it has pliers and I cannot tell you how often they were more useful than the knife itself. Despite it being my favorite multi-tool, I would say that there are quite a few occasions where it would be useful to have a bigger blade. In terms of camera gear, I'm normally sticking with one filled up camera insert that fits quite well into my backpack. In there, I'm carrying my Mavic 2 Pro with three spare batteries for all of my drone shots. I know that it isn't the most up-to-date drone, but so far I don't see much reason to switch as it's doing the job quite well. Well, in the long run it could be nice to switch over to FPV. It looks much more fun than flying a regular drone. My go-to lenses are the 35mm 1.2 art lens from Sigma and the 70-200mm G Master lens from Sony. I know many people like the range from 24 to 70mm, but I never saw much sense in it, so I prefer to have one very fast lens at 1.2 and then something longer that I could also use for some wildlife shots. For the sound, I'm using the latest Rode NTG mic with a datcat on pretty much all the time, as Norway can be quite a windy country. I'm also using the same microphone with a pop filter for my voiceover, so it is quite versatile. Apart from that, I'm enjoying the combination of a Zoom H1N recorder and a DT VLOV mic to have a on-person sound recording as a backup of everything from the NTG mic. 
both items are okay priced and every recording with a lav mic on this channel was pretty much done as a backup to the NTG mic and then synced automatically in post in DaVinci Resolve. Just in case, we are also carrying two Mofi 26,000 mAh power banks that we often charge in the car and then use it for our phones and Mac. We haven't used any solar powered batteries so far, but that is definitely something for the future. While hiking, we're using the Peak Design straps to have our cameras ready pretty much all the time. It can be a bit heavy if you're like me and have attached a small rig as well as a 70 to 200 lens to it, but I'm normally carrying the lens directly on the handle just to ease a bit of the strain that would otherwise be put on the connection to the camera. As a tripod, I'm using a dirt cheap version that I bought a few years ago on Amazon for. 30 bucks or so, it does the job, but if I'm ever upgrading, it will definitely be something a bit more solid. I'm also carrying a Joby Gorillapod with ball head in the largest version, but to be honest, I am using that way less often than I use the regular tripod. For the camera bodies, we have a Sony Alpha 7R Mark III and Mark IV that we use both for stills and filming. I know 8-bit codecs are not optimal for S-Log footage, but for now there's no budget for upgrading to a A7S 3 or FX3, so it just has to work. Speaking about non-optimal gear, if Thea is preferring to go a bit lighter on a steep hike, then we're using a 50mm 1.8 lens from Sony. The nifty 50s of pretty much every brand are dirt cheap and the Sony one is actually doing quite a good job even with autofocus and video mode. So if you're new to the game and you're looking for a quick fix to quite decent footage and stills, I would definitely recommend that lens, as it is the most bang for the buck you can get from Sony. Just to give you an impression, here are a few stills that I took with the Nifty 50 and I think they turned out quite decent. To carry everything around, I'm using a quite big tracking backpack. As weight wasn't a problem for me so far, this is my go-to solution. The model is called Yukon X1 and it's from a brand named Tatonka. In that regard, I have to say that I got this backpack for free in a collaboration a year ago. But despite that fact, after using it the last summer, I really started to appreciate the spaciousness and all the different inserts and pouches that it comes with. So if I would have to buy a backpack again, it would be something in a similar size and style from any brand that I fully trust. Most of the times we're not using all the space of the backpack at the beginning of the hike, but often it is getting a bit too warm and we have to take off clothes, so it's nice not to have to worry about space. I have been using the side of the backpack to store my tripod and the gorilla pod in and then use the top pouches for everything I need quick access to. The camera insert is from the same brand so it fits perfectly into the backpack just on top of everything else that I'm carrying so that it's also quite easy to access. Fully packed, the backpack can weigh around 25 kilos so it's very useful to have a back frame to distribute the weight using a hip belt and a chest belt so the strain is a bit taken off from your lower back. Now you have a bit of an overview of what could be helpful while hiking in Norway. And if you like outdoor and filmmaking content, then make sure to leave this channel a subscribe and we'll see you in the next video.